Okay, welcome to Rock Talks, a podcast about music documentaries. I'm David Lizerbram here with my co-host Andrew Keats, and uh, yeah, we have a special guest, a very special guest with us today, uh, Thomas Robson, who is uh, the director of Aha the Movie. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, joining us from uh, Oslo, I think our uh, our most distant uh, guest so far. Um, yeah, so the uh, the movie is coming out now. It's about the Norwegian uh, pop band Aha, who um, in the U.S. are most famous for Take On Me and the, the kind of famous uh, awesome video. Um, but, um, you know, they, they've sold over 50 million albums. They're, you know, have many hits around the world. Uh, the original trio is uh, still together in some form. Um, and um, yeah, and, and Thomas, uh, you spent apparently about four years putting this film together. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it depends a little bit uh, how you count, because I actually tried to make the film already in 2009. But uh, when I asked them, they thought it was a good idea, but they were going to split up. So no film. So then they split up for five years and I told them, you know, call me when you get back together. But they <laughs> forgot to call me and made a new album without me. And so when I started filming, I was hoping to to capture the making of a new album. And uh, if you see the film, uh, you, you notice, you know, that I immediately get three different answers uh, on that question. And one is yes, and one is maybe, and one is no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 expertly placed in the movie because you, you know I I mean speaking uh, as an an American with a a fairly limited window into Aha, I didn't know anything about the band dynamic, um, so it, it you know I I think that that moment occurs I don't know within the first five or ten minutes probably, yeah. and you very quickly you go oh okay there's there's some tension here this is this is not a uh, a happy go lucky group of guys. Um, and so that it sort of unspools from there. So I, I like that that choice to to lay that right there in the beginning. Um, yeah, can you tell us just a little bit about that and how it, how this whole project came together? Um, you know, in terms of when you did get to make the movie. Yeah, the thing is uh, that ever since I saw Let It Be uh, with the Beatles when I was like ten years old, and and later when I started making films, I've always been fascinated by the idea of of um, of, fo uh, of uh, following a band uh, while they make a record and uh, I tried that for years and usually it was impossible to finance but I, I hope that would it would be a little bit easier with uh, with aha when I finally got that chance uh, with with one of the reasons why we spent four years making the film was because of the financing. And another reason was that I really wanted to follow them for a long time. And also I'm usually a producer or mostly a producer. So I have to, to make my films in between the films I produce. So, so that's, that's partly why. And also a hard not on the road, uh, always, you know, they, they kind of tour for a couple of months each year. Uh, or every second year, so that's that's why it took so, such a long time. But um, my initial initial um, motivation is that I really love the band and think they have so much more great music than just take on me. So I really wanted to share great music and and a great story. Uh, but I also knew that the band had big conflicts and they've been there for years. So, uh, but I wasn't sure if they actually wanted to talk about them in the film, and and not, you know, I I wouldn't insist on talking about those conflicts if they didn't want to, but it it didn't take long before <laughs> they started <laughs> on their own. I didn't have to, you know, they just when they start telling the story of the band, they tell it in t three different ways. They don't remember the same way, and they don't think that that things happened uh, in the same way all three. So, and that's that's how things often are, you know, based on truth, lies, and bad memory. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and it's interesting because they they each sort of acknowledge that. You know, you, there, there's moments in the movie where, you know, it, it seems like you've just asked them a question where you say, oh, you know, um, Paul has, has said this and they're beginning as well. I, I, I certainly don't remember it that way or that's not <laughs> how I saw it. Yeah. Um, and so this comes through. And but the, the tension is interesting. Maybe you could um, talk about this a little bit. It, it's not like uh, the Eagles where they have these large blow ups, these big emotional displays. Um, the, the tension is much more bloodless and um, it, it seems like it's been there since maybe the beginning of the band from what I gather. Um, and they've, they've kind of just worked around it as they say the you know, the friendship was not the cornerstone of this band. Mm. Um, but, but the, the unemotional, un, uh, explosive, but very real tension in the band. What, what do you make of that? Is that just the guy's personalities? What, what's the, what's going on here? It's, you know, we're, we're Norwegian, so it's it's, <laughs> uh, it's not fist fights. It's silent treatment and really long emails. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, I mean, when when Mags in the beginning says, uh, in the end, you just want to punch each other. I actually cut before he says, but it hasn't really ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, so so yeah. They it's a, a lot of also backstabbing. They talk a lot uh, disrespectfully about each other, even more when the camera is off. Hmm. And uh, it's it's fascinating how much they kind of envy each other and and disrespect each other, but at the same time knowing that without the other two, it wouldn't be a uh-huh. But I guess you know, strange way. I guess that you need to be so competitive and so assured of yourself and so ambitious to actually make it. And in a band, most of the time, there needs to be more than just one personality like that. And in this case, it's all three. In many other bands, it's like maybe two. Uh, But in this case, all three kind of have some of the same strengths that in a way also becomes a weakness. Uh, so, so maybe we wouldn't have a heart at all if they didn't have this personality they have. Yeah, I, um, I was telling you earlier, my wife um, grew up in the 80s in Sweden. Um, so, um, you know, when I told her about this movie, she was so excited. It, you know, the band just needs a lot more or is well, more, much more well-known outside the U.S. You know, she was saying, oh, my older cousin had a, a poster of Morton uh, when she was a teenager. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, such a big star. Um, you know, like I said, whereas in the U.S., almost seen as a one-hit wonder. Um, you know, certainly that video is very respected, but um, most people, you know, I, I know Hunting High Low, you know, there was a few songs I can name, but not going deep into the catalog was part of the goal here to, you know, introduce or reintroduce the band um, to, to people who didn't know about them, particularly in America, or, uh, you know, how did you balance that while also getting deep into the story for the fans who maybe already had a little bit more of the background? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, definitely. You know, I, I, I see the band as very underestimated, of course, being Norwegian myself, uh, I maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not the one to say, but I feel that in the UK, for example, many bands that have had far less hits and far less great songs, even though they've had a few, are seen as, you know, much more respected. Uh, and maybe with a heart, I'm not sure, maybe because they're not British or maybe because they were just too good looking, maybe because <laughs> they had too much success. You know, so they're not kind of credible, like the Human League or Soft Cell, or you know, uh, I, I, and uh, but it's also fascinating because I think Aha uh-huh had the potential to be the Pesh Mode or U2 or the Cure, those 80s bands that really made it big, but but that's partly their own fault. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess after the initial success of Take on Me they immediately wanted to be the Beatles and start uh, doing what they wanted, which was the plan from the beginning. Let's get a hit and then we can do what we want. But then they realized when sales on the second album 
were were much poorer. Then actually on the on the third album they go back and they they take one of the much more catchy songs that were actually made already for the first album, but they thought were no we don't we don't want to repeat ourselves. So they did not use that for the second album. They even had a couple of songs that were quite similar to Take On Me that they didn't use on the second album. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if if those albums just fell down to earth and, you had, and you'd listened to and you had to discover yourself the sequence, I think most people would think that Stay On These Roads, which is their third album, was actually their second. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then when it didn't work to try to, to repeat the formula in some way uh, on the third album, then they just decided to drop all the synth stuff and become a rock band and go back to the roots of Bridges, their previous band. And, and, but that was also something they did to try to break America again, but this time from a rock, you know. But then they would have to, to do college uh, radio and they would have to do a lot of shows in smaller arenas probably and build up from that and not everyone in the band was keen to do that so some of the guys in the band wanted to continue more like the band had established themselves in the beginning and others wanted to go more in the direction of the of the fourth and the fifth album before the first split uh, but, you know, I think there's great music, uh, even, you know, when they were a synth band or when they became more of a rock band. I think there's so many great songs. And, of course, that, that was one of the ambitions to get that true to both to, well, well, not to the hardcore fans because they have heard everything, of course. But I'm really happy that even the hardcore fans uh, like the film. I guess they feel they get a little bit closer to to Morton, Paul, and Mags. Uh, and and it's really a film about the three guys and not just the band. One of the things that works well is you, since you are making this in, you know, the, in 2020, 2018, 2019, um, you've got a long, a, a lot of distance from the time when they were really um, big hits. And so you have a moment where, you know, I think Paul says, uh, turns out a lot of our fans grew up to be journalists and so we have <laughs> we have we have seated uh people who like us in in positions of power yeah. um you know Coldplay comes out and says that they were b- very big fans you too says nice things about them um and it, it you know so, so sort of that catalog which you know i have to admit that that um that album in 1990 where they say where they were trying to do a bit of a u2 thing um, I think that music sounds great. I, I, I was introduced to it by the movie, and I, 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 I it really works for me. I, I, it's, it's interesting to to hear that they have this history. Um, and then at the same time, now they're like, they're like such a clear reference point for pop music right now. Um, the movie mentions uh, the weekend song, which is basically "Take on Me" pastiche, and um, Harry Styles has a new song right now that also seems just like a <laughs> pretty blatant uh, "Take on Me" ripoff. And so uh, the the legacy of the band is really shaping and coming into into clarity right now uh, when the movie drops. It's it's a fortuitous timing. I, I don't know. Have have you talked to the guys in the band about that? About this sort of um, reintroduction they're having to the world, seemingly. Well, the thing is that um, two of the members are really happy about the film and feel that you know it's doing <laughs> great. It, did get great reception in Norway, also internationally. It has been distributed all over the world. Of course, it's not on Netflix as we speak, so it's more like available here and there, and then later, hopefully, it will get a back end in some streaming service. But but one of the members is not so happy about the film. So I guess if all three really loved the album, uh, the, the film, they would have also supported it more when they travel around and on their uh, homepage and so on. But having mixed uh, mixed reception, uh, and and I've always said, you know, that you know, uh, a, a, a rock, you know, just have a look at the Coldplay documentary. I mean, do we even remember it? It was really fascinating that they had material 
for such, you know, through the whole career and everything. And I liked it while I watched it, but I, I don't really remember it because there's no conflict, really. <laughs> there's no, yeah. there's nothing to remember in a way. So I tried to say that to, to, the, to the member that didn't like the film too much, that, you know, uh, a film like this should have some conflict, but people will go to the music anyway. I mean, I even listened to Metallica after that film <laughs> and, yes. and, yes. and, and you know, rediscovered Eagles and and um, now I'm listening to Sparks uh, a lot and so yeah. on. So yeah, yeah. those music documentaries, and especially if they have something that forces you to kind of remember them, that works for, for the music, even though you might feel that you know the other two are, are saying too much and and I don't agree and it wasn't that way and they remember wrongly or they lie or whatever. So that's a, a little bit of pity. But I hope like when the years pass and the film hopefully stands as a document of the band. Yeah. What about their um have you have you talked to them? What what's their thoughts about um how influ influential or how present their sound is right now and with uh, the weekend and Harry Styles and that sort of thing you know I'm really sure that they're proud of it you know yeah. I, 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 I think so uh, uh, it's interesting how they on one hand focus a lot on how big they could have been and all that they didn't manage to do mm -hmm. and at the same time of course being proud of what they actually uh, what actually have happened and and you know but it's funny because take on me which is their main song even even now in the rest of the world you know if you look on spotify and see this that song and then go to the second most popular song it's like <laughs> it's uh, it's incredible sure. and so to to kind of uh, to kind of not be proud of that song and being tired of it or whatever you know it's you, you just have to accept that's that was your fate in a way. You have to go on stage and and be those cartoon figures forever, and ho hopefully people can discover other things. But but that's that's how it ended up for you, and and you should be proud of it instead of just focusing on what could have been different or better, uh, unless they become so old that they forget all about the eighties and suddenly just get together and make some great new music like in their late 60s or something that would be fun yeah um you know it is kind of funny to see them struggling with you know what they feel like maybe they haven't accomplished or have yet to accomplish because then you also have video of them playing to you know 200,000 people in rio uh you know 100,000 people here or there i mean that most bands musicians <laughs> would um, be perfectly happy with that level of success um you know <clears throat> as speaking as obviously somebody who, um, you know, also watches music documentaries, um, you know, part of the selling point of, you know, kind of music documentaries, music history, sometimes is the seedier side of things. You know, you have interpersonal conflict, but the movie has no, you know, no, no sex and drugs. You know, that's just not the that's just not the content of the movie, which is not a knock on it uh, or a criticism, just an observation. Is that because it really wasn't part of their story? Is it because you were only allowed to tell part of it? Is it because you chose to exclude or include certain things they uh, they have uh, you know two of them uh, are married to the same girl uh, that they had before the band even started mm. and uh, you know when i was joking with paul who you know he was saying like yeah but those conflicts who cares he even says it in the film you know nobody cares about our little quibbles you know uh, they they will listen to the music uh, but i was i was texting him and saying did you see the crosby the crosby film <laughs> i mean <laughs> it's conflict you know uh, the half film is going to come out as you know really nothing compared to mm -hmm. that and he and he just answered well, that's all because of cocaine, so that doesn't count. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, they uh, have managed to have all of these conflicts even without ever using much drugs. They, they mm -hmm. just aren't that kind of, you know, again, Norwegians uh, brought mm -hmm. up in good homes and 
And I guess I'm, I'm not even sure if they have tried much, you know, maybe once a few of them. Uh, but really, it's not not their world. Uh, they take a glass of wine, uh, you know, and uh, and so and yeah, with the sex, they have a few children. Uh, so <laughs> some, some sex. <laughs> We they've, do done the it. they've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats to and, them, and, by the way. Some rock and roll in between the pop, synth pop. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they have it, 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 the, the sobriety, uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, that they bring to their, their ten, tension and conflict within the band um, really lends itself well uh, when they're talking about their disputes over songwriting credits, where... Um, you know, I think about a band that we've talked about on the show a lot, the band, um, they, were, you know, Robbie Robertson and Levon Helm were never able to, uh, sort of hash out their disputes about how the songwriting credits were parsed in a very, uh, measured way. Uh, they just decided that they hated each other or particularly Levon hated Robbie. Um, that's not true with Aha. They have like a very, like almost lawyerly breakdown of, well, there's different ways to define how to write a song. Um, I actually, I, maybe this is a, uh, something that people in this, in the music industry discuss a lot, but the, the table metaphor that, that I think Paul, uh, lays out, um, is kind of, kind of persuasive if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> the, h- how, um, you know, how big of a part do you think that plays in the tension of the band? Um, the sort of uh, money differences that came from who who got credit for the songwriting? I think I think they've overcome the money side because I think they when they got back together again, you know, and 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 uh, discussing, OK, let's start over it. I, I guess even. I guess, I guess even Paul being the richest uh, realize that it's a bit strange that Morton is the poor one in the band, uh, <laughs> or the one that has earned by far less. Uh, I mean, uh, but yeah, now it's more uh, an honor thing, you know. Yeah, uh, it's you know you want to go down in history. You you don't want every time you read a review. You you read that Morton has the fantastic voice and Paul is the songwriting genius and Max he's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and having written some of the biggest hits, uh, you know, being having made the riff that that pays right. for all the houses, you mm-hmm. know, it, uh, I can understand that. At the same time, it's clearly that uh, it's clear that some songs, you know, are ninety or ninety-five percent written by Paul, mm-hmm. and then it feels maybe wrong for Paul to share a fifty-fifty credit, even if it's not the money, because they can share. You know, it can says written by, and there's two people, and then they have decided that one only gets ten percent, and the other. Goes, but but it still says it looks like they've written it together, while one has actually done ninety percent. So maybe the whole way of crediting should be different. I don't know. And and I I guess I guess Paul thinks that sometimes it's more an arrangement thing than yeah. songwriting. But on the other hand, you know, sometimes a riff might not be uh, the songwriting in itself. You know, I heard a remix of Blinding Lights, which you mentioned, and yeah. it doesn't have the, re- it's by chromatics, and it does not have the take on me rhythm, and it yeah. does not have the riff, mm. but it still has the, 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 the verse and the chorus, and in a way you could say that's the songwriting, <laughs> and the rest right. is arrangement. But on the other hand, you could say that sometimes the arrangements is so important that it should be credited as songwriting so um, i mean it's really difficult and it's really easy for me to see it from all sides i mean i think just by just by adding morton's voice the song goes up a few percent i mm-hmm. mean 20 30 40 maybe i mean yeah. so he, he should almost get songwriting credit only for bringing his voice uh, to a song 
uh, clearly, you know, if you if you ever listen to some of Savoy Paul's solo things, and he Paul has a nice voice too, but you know those songs with Morton's voice, uh, and and uh, Max has, has always added nice details, or uh, or parts that are really really important. And for example, the sun always shines on TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole intro is is uh, Max, and also the Sintrif. Now the Sintrif on Sun Always Shines on TV isn't as you know you don't remember it as Take on Me, but I can understand why he feel that he's a little bit more part of the songwriting on that song, and and then on others you know an interesting thing nowadays uh, with all the sampling you know is that if you make the ba- bass line on a song. And one song, which uh, is on the credits of a uh, the movie, has this bass line: do 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 do. If some rapper took that bass line and just made a song based on those uh, bass notes, all the money would go to Paul. But that bass line is written by Max. Oh wow! <laughs> so, but the song is written by Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So you know it's it's a crazy complicated thing because and the reason why I understand both is that you know if you have made something you have a vision of something and somebody helped you but still you had the whole vision and then it looks like you did it together all the way through I can understand that from a certain point of view and at the same time it's it's not so bad to be generous you know to share a little bit you know they nobody really cares and uh, you know in the in in the Beatles, who wrote, you know, okay, you can hear if Paul sings, it's probably a Paul song. If John sings, it's probably a John song. But in and in the end, people find out, you know, if they're really into it. But most people, <laughs> they just want to hear the great song. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we could all agree that intellectual property lawyers ruin everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, you know, another thing that is not in this movie that we see in a lot of rock docs and sometimes we complain about is a lot of talking heads of other, other musicians, other, you know, fans, things like that. Um, I'm sure that was a choice you made, but I'm just, I am kind of curious. Um, you know, did they, when they, especially in the eighties, they were living in England. Um, did they have a, a relationship with a lot of their contemporaries? I'm thinking of like Duran Duran or bands like that, that um, were certainly popular around the same time, maybe had a similar image in a way. Um, or were they kind of just always on their own because they're from Norway and they had their own kind of vision and things they're trying to do? I I know that Morton knew at least Steve Strange, you know, from Visage uh, Mm -hmm. a lot. And I I think a few others. He was the the most social one, probably, at least before the breakthrough. Uh, uh, I also know that they loved Echo and the Bunnyman, or at least Paul and Max loved Echo and the Bunnyman, so maybe they met. And also, you know, when they did Unplug, they also invited Alison Moyer. I'm not sure they... And, you know, you meet people, and having met once or twice on the road, but uh, I'm not sure how much they they had a friendship. Or so I know that Paul really wanted... When when uh, Haas split the first time, Paul tried to get the singer of Talk Talk mm. to get into his band. That didn't happen, and I know that when uh, doing the unplugged thing, they tried to get Morrissey, so they really loved the Smiths, you know. <laughs> they but they also hate the thing. I don't think they liked Duran Duran, Wham, or Haircut One Hundred. That those bands <laughs> felt, and you know, it's strange because they kind of became synth pop stars a little bit by coincidence. One coincidence was that they had to go to England as a duo, so they needed a drum machine. <laughs> And they were a little bit interested in, in bridges also, but suddenly, you know, now let's make synth pop music. And but they were inspired by Soft Cell and 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 the Pesh Mode beca- before they became huge and the Human League when they were, you know, quite big but not massive. And and then Morton, you know, when they when he joined the band, he had long hair and played in a blues band. But then he went to England and started to, you know. Uh, and then they realized, my God, he looks great. <laughs> and so <laughs> suddenly they became pop stars. 
you know, they wanted to be rock musicians and became pop stars. Uh, and so I guess they didn't identify with other pop stars in, mm-hmm. the, in the same way. And that's also why, I, I guess, on the second album, they immediately wanted to be more of a rock band. And, you know, with Manhattan Skyline, they wanted to release a song that's not typically a single and all of that. So, so no, I, I don't think they were very much part of the London scene. But uh, And and to, to answer, you know, your thoughts about, you know, you need some other people to talk about the band, but the usual thing about other people saying how great a band is when it's when everybody knows it's great, or at least yeah. I think so. I mean, I, I heard this story about this guy who made a film about Rolling Stones, uh, about the recording of Exile on Main Street, the quite new one. I don't remember the name of the director. And M- Mick Jagger insisted that that some contemporary musicians <laughs> would talk about how great the Stones were. And the director said, you're the Rolling Stones. You don't need <laughs> how many bands feel, you know, that somebody that's younger and more hip than us should say how great we are. So that's one of the things I, I, I wanted to avoid. You know, it's easy to fall into cliches. And I, I opened the film like most films, you know, the band standing backstage before going on stage. You have, you, and you have to tell the whole story of, of Take On Me and you have to use some things that, that can easily be seen as cliches, but I tried to avoid some of them. And one of them was that one. Okay, I, I thought it was okay to include Chris Martin and to have somebody else talk about it, since Chris actually says it by himself on stage. Uh, but that was also something that that the ma- house manager wanted, you know, to to have some of those guys. And I said, sorry, you know, James Blunt, it's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, w- there's one Easter egg in the movie. We, we have a, a hunt going throughout our series for uh, the mega concert in Rio. <laughs> uh, is a is a is a nice Easter egg in in lots of uh, of rock docs. There's only the second appearance in in our in our show. We uh, Tina Turner has a mega concert in Reno, Rio. Yeah. Um, while we have you, I want to ask because you you mentioned the the early influence of seeing Let It Be. Uh, I gotta ask, uh, what did you think of Get Back in that case? Uh, fantastic. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I watched it all and thought it was. You know, it was exactly what I wanted to do with Aha, actually, to, to be mm-hmm. there. And we have this moment where Morton is sick of his own voice and doesn't want to sing that song. And, you know, uh, uh, and, and we would have had much more of those moments if we could actually follow the recording of a new album and just not the rehearsals uh, of, of the old songs. And so watching, and you know, it's incredible that so much great material has been in some boxes for decades <laughs> because yeah. a film shouldn't be longer than, than this. And and then you have, I mean, uh, the only thing I didn't like was that they play the same song on the roof. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> all the real concert. Uh, but I, no, I, I, it's, it's definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. And... and, and um, it's funny because one of the fascinating things about Let It Be was that, of course, it's like, oh, I can see my heroes while they make music. You know, it was magical, you know, as a 10 year old. But also they argued and I was so shocked <laughs> about the argument. <laughs> and then when I watched Let It Be again, many, many years after, uh, actually just a few years ago, you know, that arguing lasts for like 90 seconds or something of the whole film. And mm. the exact same scene is still in Get Back. So, but what is but but what you see much more in Get Back is how much fun they had, of course, and and the arguing was just a small part of it. And and I mean, if we had followed a hard recording a new album, I think it would have been, you know, silent treatment, all of that. But it would also be funny moments because yeah. sometimes Paul and Mags, who are, you know, I, I don't think they hate each other, but they de- really don't respect each other much. Uh, sometimes, you know, when one of them play a false note or something, the other one goes, ha 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 ha. Aha, there you go. <laughs> so they they really have this childish thing, you know, they've been together since they were uh, 10, 
12 years old. And, and so if anything happens uh, with some of the others or whatever, you know, they would, would be there for, for each other because it's not friendship, that's true, but it's family. You know how family is. You know, uh, family and friendship are two different things. Family, you don't choose. And friendship, mm -hmm. you choose. And end friendships, it's much harder to end family. So so I see a house of family that uh, that ended up together a little bit by coincidence. <laughs> uh, you know how it is with bands. You know, many people think that bands are like friends that have been together for 10 years, and then they decide to start a band. But in reality, a band is like... I want to start a band. Oh, this guy from the other class has a guitar. I'm going to ask <laughs> him. And then you ask him, do you know anyone who plays bass? Yeah, I think, <laughs> you know, and then a drummer. Yeah, let's put in an ad. And then suddenly you have four guys together and you get world success. And you're stuck with these guys that you don't really know. And I, I guess that's the story of 90% of all bands. So <laughs> That's the reason why it doesn't. It's not always easy. <laughs> um, you know, as we kind of wrap this up, um, first of all, congratulations on the movie and achieving a dream from when you're ten years old. I mean, that's that must be very um, gratifying. <clears throat> I know you're a fan of music and music documentaries. Do you have any interest now that you've done this in uh, getting, you know, getting into another band or, or something similar, or, or is this like you've checked it off the list and, you, and you're good? Well, I have, uh, no, I definitely won't. I, I did make a, a series about the Norwegian punk movement. So, uh, and I, and it's interesting now being, you know, part and have felt that punk was kind of a life changer for me. Uh, I, I'm really curious. I think, yeah, I have this idea that may, um, to maybe make a film called The Punk Pensioners. <laughs> you know, because all the punks now are 60 plus. And where are they now? You know, you have the rich ones, the Clash and Billy Idol, and then you have the ones that are really poor and on the dole still. And, you know, and all over the world different. So that's one idea, to travel around the world uh, before they, they die. Uh, then I have an idea about, you know, another that was another Norwegian that was famous in America for a while, but now is... It's not so much famous, and I don't know if you even know him, but it's Sondre Lurke. Or yeah, something. yeah, sure. Yeah, he, he made a song for the film um, uh, Dan in Real Life. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and he did a duet. Maybe with 15, him. 20 years ago, something like that. It's not that. He, well, I guess he was, yeah, yeah. But now he's making, making his best music ever. You know, it's released two albums now. The last, his last album's got fantastic reviews, and he's so. You know, I, I guess I will continue to make films about Norwegians that were once famous in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it coming. Nice. Yeah. Well, um, I, you know, this was really great. Uh, I hope you do get a chance to make those movies, and I know Andy and I will be right there to watch it. We, we'd love to speak to you again. Um, yeah, anybody who's listening, of course, um, you know, watch out for AHA the movie. It's kind of doing some uh, limited theatrical runs, and hopefully there'll be a streamer situation soon. But um, look out for it. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Thomas, anything else you want to plug or share while we have you? Um, I'm happy, and thank you very much. And it's always, always fun to talk about music. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us on, uh, on Rockdown. Yeah.